Hello, everyone. So in case y'all have been living under a knackle stack since last November, there's a new generation that immediately outdated all the videos that we worked so hard on. Sucks, huh? Who, Who said, said you, you could, could leave, leave the, the dungeon? dungeon? Anywho, I have heard your cries. Ari, they say. What do you think about the Paldea region? What do you think about Gen 9? Well, the time has come for me to speak on it, but since I already have a bunch of videos on various topics, I'm just going to use this as an addendum, so to speak. So I'll be covering all of the same topics that I did earlier, minus the guest spots. Those are expensive and I can't afford Wambu money anymore. Sheesh. I got babies to pay for. No updates yet for the Teal Mask or Indigo Disc DLC. We're waiting to see if they're any good, but we're not super keen on farming. If nothing changes, she's in F tier. <laughs> In any case, pleasantries and whatnot out of the way, let us begin. Once again, we have a star-studded cast of gym leaders with big personalities, mostly, but we'll get to that. Aside from their creative designs and diverse personalities, what makes each of them unique is that each gym leader is a different kind of artist or entertainer. Except one. And he my favorite. Oh look, I'm about to be as basic as he is. But can you blame me? And the majority of the fandom? First off, let me get the boring thing out of the way, which isn't the gym leader with one facial expression. It's the gym challenge. It was actually a pretty diverse and intense puzzle hunt. One of the best challenges we've gotten since Pokemon started doing alternate ways of getting to the gym leader. I mean, pushing an olive, come on, Katie, do better. I don't mean that, I kind of like her, but still. The minute I realized he was the gym leader after we had chatted with him, I was in absolute agreement with him. I also have a full-time job along with wrangling all the chaos around me, plus twins, so I felt his drudgery in my soul. In trying to make him very generic and not stand out, it had the complete opposite effect. And I'm very sure that that was intentional. I constantly say, and I swear I need this on a t-shirt or something, that Larry is a mood. He's just so hashtag relatable. I know I don't want to do anything that requires movement or brain power after I eat my favorite meal. Just let me nap, y'all. And any salary man who wants to keep their job and isn't quiet quitting will know that being hounded by the boss is the worst thing ever. Larry is the anti agretzko and I am here for it. Oh yeah, his Pokemon are cool too, I guess. You know, it's kind of interesting that his strongest Pokemon was Staraptor and he wound up being a flying type Elite Four member. Foreshadowing at its, I want to say finest, but that doesn't scream Larry to me. So foreshadowing at its overtime rate. Given that most of the gym leaders are entertaining or at least relatable, there were really only two contenders for the worst slot. The first was Tulip. I hate this chick's challenge, and that's being generous to call it a challenge. I don't understand why she's named Tulip when she's a psychic type gym leader, and she has the blandest design out of all of them. I mean, look, look at Kofu, Rhyme, Iono. They are bright and dynamic and just cool. Tulip has one color. Her eyes are on fleek, but I've never understood why people like that little white mustache over their lip. I did you just drink some milk and forget to wipe, honey? I don't understand. Basically, of all of them, she's the one who looks like just a person. We've had models before, Elisa and Nessa, and a fashion designer, Valerie, so she really doesn't stand out. The only thing is that she's a makeup artist. But why not go all out? There's some amazingly wild makeup artists online that turn themselves into snakes or dragons and- Focus. Right, fine, I'm harping. She isn't even the lowest, only because her team is decent. That's it, that's her only saving grace. And if I were completely biased, I'd put her on here because she bothers my feelings. No, the actual worst one is frustrated head trimmer Kun Brassius. Where to start? This guy, I cannot get a read on him. He dresses like a fancy mountain climber or rodeo ranger, but he's a botanical artist? Sculptor? There are a buttload of statues around. I've never been quite sure what his specific art was. Even if he blatantly told me, I would be just like, well, I feel bad for him since he was super duper sick, and it looks like his eye bags have never recovered, but at the same time, is therapy a thing in Paldea? Like, that kind of obsession isn't good for you, sweetie. You know what? Why hasn't there been a therapist gym leader, actually? That would be so cool. Definitely a psychic type or a fairy type with some sort of quiz element to it to actually, like, mix up the teams depending on your personality. That would be pretty fun. Focus! Right. <sighs> I hate, 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 hate. His gym puzzle. So hey guys, you know how Scarlet and Violet is poorly optimized, right? Well guess what gym challenge turned my game into a low budget PowerPoint presentation. 
Guess which gym challenge was super crowded and slow to the point where I screamed in frustration. Guess which gym challenge took me eight minutes to finish because I couldn't find the last god dang Sunflora! And then, when you get to fight him, it's an absolute letdown. He has three Pokemon. Only one is from this region. Even Katie, harmless Katie with her little bakery, she's so cute, has both of her non-Terra Pokemon be from this region. He has no excuse. Why Petty Lil? Because it's pretty. He's an artist. Why not edgy little Capsa Kid? I think the most I can say for him is... Okay, the truly widow thing was actually a pretty good joke. I'll give him that. <laughs> like, ha, ah, finally, typing is right. Yeah, huh. uh, but I don't know. My whole time in that town was a miserable freaking experience, and I never, ever, ever want to do it again. And I know exactly who to blame. Now we move on to the tier list rankings, starting with rivals. Once again, we have another case of N syndrome where the villain team leader is also kind of a rival. So I'm going to stick to my principles and keep Penny sequestered to the villain team ranking section. We will talk about her, promise. But for now. Oh, Arceus, here we go. Okay, bear with me. I don't know if this is an established observation or not, but here goes. Generation 9's main theme is passion, right? Look at the gym leaders. All have artistic passions. The treasure hunt is about finding your passion. But with it comes the cautionary tale. Take it too far and passion becomes obsession. And Nomoda took it too far. Are you okay, female Goku? I feel like my feelings on the two rivals flipped over time. I wanted to hang out with Arvin more by the end. In real life, I would want to hang out with him after his therapy sessions. He seems like a sweetie deep down. Anyone who loves dogs can't be 100% bad. But while Nomona made a great first impression, over time she began to annoy me. I am finding that I don't enjoy obsessive characters very much. And considering the fact that pretty much every sentence of hers references battling or the league or champions or blah, 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 I just tuned her out. She's not bad. Far from it, she's B tier. For one, she's kind of the counterbalance to Arvin's snippiness and Penny's doom and gloom in Area Zero. So she's a necessary ray of optimism. Secondly, she's still a decent person, if a little cuckoo for Crookerooks, as my darling Alistair would say. Yes, but she seems more, ooh, pretty colors, than <laughs> I'm Princess Stabity, stab, kill, kill. And thirdly, and possibly most importantly, she's a good challenge, which is what a rival should be. She uses many new Pokemon with a couple good old standards, but oddly she picks the starter weak against yours? Cocky much? Or she thought it was just cute? <laughs> wait, wait, I've been informed. Thank you, voice of reason. She chooses the weaker Pokemon at the start on purpose so you can improve. She's already received champion rank. So it makes sense to have her literally be your senpai and check in on you every once in a while to see how your journey to be the best like no one ever was is going. I don't know whether to be thankful or insulted. Because I have standards, do I? The only gripe I really have with her team is Pomot. Yes, it's the Pika clone. I know the modern rivals need something Pika related. I'm looking at you and your Alola Raichu there, Hal. But no. The excellent moveset on the Gudra, however, makes up for it. Pneumonia here is good, solid. I don't hate her, but I don't feel all the feels with her like I do Silver or Wally or even Sharon. She's just a bit much at times, but she's still pretty decent. Show of hands. How many people thought you were going to hate this guy at the start? Don't blame you, I did too. He already made a reservation in D tier right next to Bede for his sucky attitude at first. He starts as disagreeable, if I'm being charitable. But then things just kept piling on as you go find the Titans with him. First, he's passionate about food. We'll never say no to that. Y'all have seen me. I like food. But then he socks you in the teeth with his poor Mabostiff. Ah, that is not fair to manipulate me with Doggo. How effing dare you? Look at this face. I manipulated enough already. The amount of effort he puts into helping his best friend and how choked up he gets when his buddy makes marginal improvements when he wasn't sure this was going to work. And when all his efforts pay off, it's just... Oh, <laughs> I need fuzz therapy. One second. <laughs> Anyways, back to our regularly scheduled trauma. The gut punches just keep coming. Abandoned by the seemingly sane parent. Raised and brushed aside by the workaholic obsessed parent, whom we later find out died without reaching out to him. The freaking AI had to do its best to rectify the parent's mistake. And it wasn't even programmed to do that. It just did it because it felt it was the right thing to do. What the distortion world? Why is the robot a better person than the person? 
Sorry, bad parenting is a new trigger for me. Gee, I wonder why. In the end, Arvin is just a ball of unresolved trauma after watching his only remaining parent work themselves to death, his bestie get nearly killed in front of him, and being on his own for Arceus knows how long. Oh, and he has battles too. And they're tough if you went in underleveled like Josh did. Hey, I still won, item junkie. But even then, the Pokemon he has makes a lot of sense when you think about how much he likes to cook. A Pokemon that gathers and hoards berries, a shellfish, spices, mushrooms, the mushrooms, and salt. I mean, that sounds like a Master Chef mystery box, to be honest. Maybe a nice mushroom seafood risotto with a berry sorbet for dessert or an amuse bouche. Mm -hmm. But what keeps him out of S tier is that the best parts of him are things that happen to him more than what he actually is. He doesn't have a bad personality, it's just decent. Blue had an interesting personality. Silver had an interesting personality. Wally had a compelling personality. All of them had arcs. Arvin kind of doesn't as much. He ends the story pretty much the same as he starts, if a little more resigned to the lack of true resolution with his past. In the end, you, the player, just understand him more, which isn't terrible, but it's not quite the S tier material I'm looking for here. But how about we get him into the therapist gym leader too? Someone get these people a Gardevoir, or at least an Indeedy. All right, so attempts at a low scale, possibly sympathetic villain team haven't been positively received in the past. Team Skull was eh, and Team Yell was oof. So it really seemed like Team Star was set up for failure, considering their scope at first glance appeared to just be school bullies. But oh, were we so very wrong. You see, in modern school districts, there's this thing. This thing where you can get beat up surreptitiously every day. You can get bullied physically, emotionally, mentally, even um, special physically. And often schools will not believe you or just tell you to shake it off. But the minute you fight back, you get punished too. So let's say, for example, big old Chatticus Rex gives you a black eye. You swing back and you both get suspended or expelled. You see the issue here? The victims get punished the same way as the bullies, even though they were just defending themselves. So what can you do? <laughs> this is Team Star in a nutshell. They tried to go the correct route. They reported the bullying to the school, but the school buried it. They were the ones who said enough was enough, grouped up, fought back, and are getting punished by the system for it. Each of the key members lets you see that anyone can be a victim of bullying, not just the meek and small. Enjoy something a little too much? Bullied. Follow the rules and be straight-laced? Bullied. Be conventionally attractive? Bullied. Be well off? Bullied. Excel in any way? Bullied. Each of the Team Star bosses have big and sympathetic personalities. From the goofy old-fashioned Atticus, the chill Giacomo who made that banger of a boss theme, the too pure for this world Aerie, and the funny and feisty Mela. I think the only member that I wasn't really super keen on was Ortega. Yeah, you shouldn't bully people, period. Even if, oh, they're rich, so they deserve it. Pacifica's rich, Mabel. She's cheating at life. But his twerpy attitude made me lose a few sympathy points for him. And then we have our end substitute, Penny. It wasn't too surprising that she was Cassiopeia the whole time, but you know, kids game. This is what happens when your hair is too unique, dear. Good Lord, with hair like that, I bet you've never lost a game of who's the pro tag. But I think I vibe with her the most out of the three crater critters. Victim of bullying, check. Sassy and smart, check. Slight attitude issue towards those with authority and higher social standing, check. Definitely not crazy enough for all the madness in Area Zero, double check. She's the doom and gloom to Nimona's Red Bull-fueled optimism, and yet she doesn't have the same level of trauma associated with Area Zero as Arvin, so she's able to provide balance between the two. Plus, she's so precious! Look at her cute little face and her huge glasses and pinchy cheeks! I wanna smush her! And I legit want her bag. But there are a few problems with Team Star that keep them out of S tier. The base raids are cool ideas, but slogs to get through. Despite the sparkle and flash, the grunt outfits are really bland. And like I said before, their scope is really small compared to hard hitters like Plasma or Galactic. Really, the only threat they truly posed was to themselves, and they knew that. Darn, they're too honorable. Honor, 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 honor. <laughs> so we finally got that A tier slot filled. Woohoo! Oh, but now we don't have any time to do your taxes, sorry. I think I'm going to break a few hearts with this first placement. And there is no Wombu here to temper my unfiltered opinions, so get ready for pure, unadulterated me. First, 
And before you ask, yes, this is a JoJo reference. Yes, yes, I know, I have no taste. But Donald Duck here wasn't the most popular for a reason, guys. His first two forms are almost underdesigned. Quaxley looks like just a duck with a hat, like a rough draft of Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And What's His Feathers looks like an angry duck with Mozart hair. Thus, we have the next member of the Egg Club. Just look at that head. He's a bird, though, so it fits. Quaquaval is fine. I know what they were doing, paying tribute to Carnaval, though I know who he really looks up to. But what really kills him is that his mood pool is quacking. I mean, lacking. I'm firing whoever wrote that, but anyways, look at this. Quaquaval's fighting type is not utilized to its fullest potential. Naturally, it only learns three fighting type moves, one of which you have to remember. And then it only learns five fighting type TMs, two of which it learns naturally. It can also learn bulk up, but since it's not offensive, I don't really count it. Keep in mind, I like the stat balance. High attack with decent everything else, plus a signature move that boosts its already decent speed when used successfully. I don't have a lot of gripes there, but since it's clearly supposed to be a physical attacker and most of the moves it learns are physical, why not just shave 10 to 15 points off special attack and stick them on speed? That way Aqua Step is really devastating. Come on. We don't have a lot of water fighting types. Just Polyrath, Paldi and Tauros, Urshifu, and Caldeo. And we finally get a starter with this pretty rare typing. And I don't know, it's a little disappointing. I don't exactly know what I was expecting from Daffy's sophisticated little brother here, but it wasn't a lackluster move pool and two thirds of the designs being underwhelming. So he quaquavolifies for B tier. Okay, who is- Well, hello there, pretty kitty. Will you actually stay a kitty cat and turn into a jaguar or, or nope, you're gonna evolve into this generation's furry bait starter. Nice. Guys, I like cats too, but let them be effing cats. Good cats. We already did a starter kitty with Linton, and you know how much I love him, but he turned bipedal at the end, and can't I just have a really cool looking tiger or jaguar or panther or something? Moving on, the Sprigatito line is really good. The typing is not the best, I will admit. Four times weak to bug at the end? Yikes. Especially when bug type moves and Pokemon have become more prevalent in battling, plus six other weaknesses. But it makes up for it with pretty great physical sweeping stats and a choice move pool. Its signature move, Flower Trick, gives you guaranteed crits at 70 power, which means it's actually 105 power, and it never misses. Honestly, the natural moveset is so good, I didn't bother with TMs. Add U-turn to get me out of bad situations, play rough for coverage, Night Slash for increased crit and stab, and Flower Trick. I didn't really need much else. If I had to nitpick, I'd say it could have used the dark type a little better, but hey, compared to Guacoval, it's night and day. Seriously, who snuck into my script? They are fire! Speaking of the dark type though, I do kind of like that they went with a Zoro cat. I guess that was the easiest way to incorporate the dark type and still be baity, but come on. You can keep the typing with a quadrupedal jaguar that can camouflage itself in the night of the jungle. Come on, give me a quadrupedal kitty that people don't want to bang. Sorry, the internet is getting to me. First fire starter in S tier. Only took nine generations. First off, oh my gosh, look at that doofy little face with the little buck tooth and this cheese slice on his belly. <laughs> and Crocolore is the treasure of the egg club because he has double egg. His hat and his round and chumby body. Give me egg. And thank you, Arceus, Mew, and Rayquaza for leaving him on his own four feet, dang it. Let him just be the super cool Dia de los Muertos Swamp Dino. Fear him, Florida man. Skeledurge is by far my favorite design for a starter in a long freaking time. It's just so cool. And I want it to scare people on my lawn every Halloween. It's even got both Scarlet and Violet on its body. It's clearly the best in the developer's baby this gen. Getting on to more technical battles stuffy stuff. I am so happy with the typing. I love ghost types. I think they may have surpassed psychic type as being my favorite. So when I heard that the cute little cup of hot chocolate turned into one of my favorite typing combinations, I about died. Fire ghost is becoming a popular combination among the level of firefighting. And we can see why it works very well. Both have a wide array of special moves, which works perfectly for Skeledurge. I think they set him up for success. A lot of Pokemon this gen are physical attackers. And Skeledurge is one of the few that has special attack as primary and high defense. The developers wanted Steve Irwin's revenge to survive in this open world wasteland. Sure, he doesn't have a lot of ghost type moves, but let's be honest, there's not a lot of ghost type moves to begin with. 
And really, isn't Shadow Ball like all you need? It's strong, it lowers special defense, and it kills your dreams when used by French ladies I hate. Overall, even with the slight underutilization of Ghost Type in the moveset, I think Skeledurge is more than worthy of an S rank. See, Wombu? I don't hate all fire types, they just have to be attached to Ghost. I love Chandelure, is that better? Don't hurt me. So HMs suck a right? One of the best parts about the latter third of the Pokemon generations is that we don't have to deal with them anymore. I mean, sometimes that means getting rid of the moves themselves. I like Surf, don't be hating. But overall, it's a wonderful thing. And they've done it in different ways. In Gen 7, we had the Ride Pokemon. I refuse to walk in those games. I will always be on Stoutland because he's faster than your run cycle and he's an item fighter. And in Gen 8, the bike was kind of the do everything machine but you didn't need a lot of HMs there. What we need is a combination of a ride Pokemon and a do everything machine, but we only want to animate one thing and you can't use it in battle because that'd be too fun, right? Hmm, what to do? I know, we make the legendary Pokemon the bikes. That'll do it. And thus, Robot Toothless and Toothless in a Hat were born. since Gen 3, the legendaries have become more and more integrated into the story to varying degrees. But the Rhydons are probably the most involved legendary Pokemon that they can be. Firstly, the intro cutscene is from their perspective. Then you kind of feed the feral puppy and it follows you home right after you get your starter. And while not every plot line revolves around them, the Arvin one sure does, and you know how much we stand the Arvin story around here. And of course, you kind of bond with your particular motorcycle wyvern as you abuse the glitches to travel all over Paldea. It's a fun experience. I bet you've noticed that I've been referring to Koridon and Miraidon as kind of one and the same throughout this entry. Mostly because, well, I think they are pretty dead even in terms of like ability, strength, appearance, and typing. But if I have to separate them, I shall. Koridon suits the primal slash prehistoric theming really well. He looks rugged and feral, especially when he's in his full power mode. His hat reminds me of those Native American feathered headdresses or war bonnets. And those are almost basically the equivalent to a Medal of Honor. Fitting, considering his paradox name is Winged King. Koridon's strength and imposing visage commands respect. And while one fairy move will bring it to its knees, it's still a freaking cool Pokemon. Miraidon, on the other hand, is sleek and, well, more motorcycle-y? I don't know, I forgot that it was an actual Pokemon sometimes with how streamlined the design is. Also, its full power form doesn't give me the chills as much as Koridon. However, Electric Dragon is better than Fighting Dragon. This is just plain, easy fact. Plus, I have a soft spot for it because I played Violet, and I feel like its stats and moveset are more suited to my fighting style. In the end, while I like Koridon's appearance better, I think Maridon's functionally better. I don't think there's anything wrong with either of them, but they just aren't as special as the S tier entries on the original list. I mean, Mewtwo versus the Vroom Vroom Salamanders, which are you picking? And thus, we have come to the end of this little update video. Maybe I'll talk about the DLC at some point. But for right now, I'm running on three hours of sleep, determination, and weirdly spiced sandwiches trying to keep two flailing potatoes alive. I will return. Someday. Definitely when Gen 10 comes out, if not before. Hugs, kisses, I'm gonna go nap.